Alright fellas, so as one commenter pointed out, there seems to be a distinct lack of videos, articles, and easily accessible material discussing the Mongolian People's Republic. Which is especially interesting when you consider that it was the second ever socialist nation coming pretty quickly after the Soviet Union. So to try and fill this gap a bit, I've decided to make a handful of videos discussing the nation in multiple parts so as to not make one single overly long video. So with all that being said, let's begin. As the US Federal Research Division puts it, socialist development transformed Mongolia from a predominantly agrarian nomadic economy in 1921 into a developing agricultural industrial economy in the late 1980s. According to the Mongolian constitution, there were two forms of socialist ownership, state ownership, which was dominant in most sectors of the economy, and cooperative ownership, which was most noticeable in the agricultural sector. It should be noted that private ownership did exist to some extent, but until economic reforms in the mid-80s, the scale of private ownership was mostly trivial, with the exception of livestock ownership, which we'll get to later. The direction of the economy came from a national plan determined by the state alongside an annual budget. Foreign trade was similarly determined by the state. Economic planning in Mongolia found its start with an initial five-year plan for the first half of the 1930s and was mostly centered around production goals and collectivizing agriculture. This plan, however, was abandoned about halfway through after meeting stiff resistance and failing production goals. By the time 1941 rolled around, war had led to shortages necessitating the introduction of new annual plans. Five-year plans were then reintroduced in 1948 and saw continued use until the fall of the nation. The plans themselves were produced by the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party, which I'll simply refer to as the party from now on. The plans produced by the party consisted of general guidelines for development, which the Commission on Economic Budget Affairs would then use to create both five-year and annual economic plans. Once these plans were approved, they would then become law. The relevant committees and ministries would then implement these throughout the various sectors of the economy. Beginning in the early 1960s, Mongolia then coordinated their five-year plans with those of the USSR, who they had always worked closely with. The Soviet Union even trained Mongolian planners. The plans consisted of mostly what one would expect, quotas and targets for the various sectors of industry and agriculture, as well as societal goals like increased living standards and scientific development. The Ministry of Finance was in charge of preparing these annual budgets and would assist in the creation of local budgets as well. These national budgets included those of the central government, of the administrative subdivisions, the city governments, and social insurance. On average, around 38% of the budget went towards developing the economy, 42% went to social programs, and around 20% towards defense and other smaller expenses. Although, I should be clear that these numbers changed significantly through the years. This is simply the average. Now, as most of the socialist world did around the time, in the late 1980s Mongolia undertook economic reforms with four main goals in mind. Accelerating development, further applying science and technology to production, reforming management and planning, greater independence for enterprises. Reforms began in 1986, first attempting to make the administration of the economy more efficient and reduced the amount of positions by 3,000. Economic management was also significantly decentralized and the five-year plans became much less specific. Cities and administrative subdivisions took on more autonomy and responsibility. Prior to these reforms, enterprises that operated at a loss had been subsidized, but these new economic reforms led to experimentation and more financial autonomy. Individual enterprises were now accountable for their losses and the reforms overall led to a mixture of planning and markets. Prior to the 1920s, Mongolia did not have any of its own banks or even its own currency. Bartering with goods and livestock, alongside the use of foreign currencies, were the dominant means of exchange within the nation. Foreign banks and monasteries were the main sources of credit, but this all changed when the newly formed socialist government began a series of reforms, beginning with the establishment of a national bank and an official currency in 1924 and 25, respectively. By 1928, all foreign currencies were out of circulation and a year later the government fully took over foreign trade and thus stopped private money lenders within the nation. These actions finally allowed the finances of the nation to stabilize and set the foundation for the nation's plans and industrialization. 
1924, at the foundation of the socialist state, large industry within Mongolia consisted of a coal mine and an electric power plant. Within 15 years, gross industrial output went from 300,000 Tugriks to 124 million Tugriks. The development of industry especially ramped up following World War II with the introduction of a fully centrally planned economy akin to that of the Soviet Union, alongside increased aid from the USSR and China. With this, Mongolia continued to expand industry and modernize what it already had. By 1960, gross industrial output reached 677 million Tugriks. At the time of the start of the Mongolian People's Republic, the native Mongolian workforce consisted mostly of nomadic herders and monks, with Russians and Chinese making up the rest. This was a difficult point to start from, and the nation now had the job of turning this into a workforce suitable for a modern industrial economy. This involved addressing many issues including illiteracy, an almost complete lack of qualified workers, and cultural attitudes that did not mesh well with systematized and regular work and schedules. The party leaders stated in the first year of the nation's existence that Mongolia had no more than 150 industrial workers. Due to this, foreign labor, and in particular, Soviet labor, was essential to the early development of the nation. In 1934, about half of all industrial workers were foreign, although this number was down to about 13% by 1940. Throughout the existence of the nation, Soviets and other Comic-Con members played a very important role as advisors and laborers within the workforce. Available manpower was also included within the annual and five-year plans, taking into account total availability, distribution, training, young people entering the workforce, and qualifications. Manpower itself was mostly allocated through two main ways. The first was through local committees. They would look at the wishes of the worker, where they live, and their family situation, and would provide them with work warrants. Work warrants were used to acquire a job from the management of workplaces and also guaranteed a job that was relevant to one's education and area of study. The second form was through recruitment. If a certain sector lacked sufficient laborers, then state organizations would recruit workers to fill positions who would then sign contracts to work the position for at least a certain amount of time, up to three years. In terms of workers' rights and work itself, the workday varied between 8 to 7 hours depending on the job, with more difficult occupations having shorter days. All workers also had a 6-hour workday before holidays and on Saturdays. Overtime was restricted with the exception of emergencies. There was 8 public holidays and a minimum of 15 days of paid vacation. Miners could work starting at age 16 if they so chose, and had a maximum workday of 7 hours and were not allowed to work difficult labor jobs. They were also guaranteed a month of paid vacation. Pensions, time off for illness, maternity leave, and disability pay were also guaranteed for all workers, as was assistance in situations where the breadwinner of the family died. The retirement age was between 55 to 60 depending on sex. There was also a system of resorts available at no cost to workers and retirement homes for the elderly. In terms of workers' rights specific to women, it was illegal to refuse to hire or fire women on the basis of pregnancy or already existing children, and workplaces with large numbers of female workers were required to have facilities for nurseries and kindergartens. Finding information on the actual salaries themselves was difficult, but salaries did rise 45% between 1960 and 1985. In general, most workers were trade union members, but the actual percentage varied greatly depending on the specific occupation and industry. The main roles of the trade unions themselves was to influence wages and working conditions and legislation. In day-to-day -day operations, they most commonly oversaw workplaces to make sure that the regulations and rights were being followed, as well as overseeing the various resorts, retirement homes, and other institutions meant for the workers. The development of Mongolian agriculture was slow. Initial attempts at collectivization were unsuccessful, as were efforts to make the primarily nomadic population into farmers. So attention was instead focused on building voluntary cooperatives and farmers associations. The government also began the development of their own state-run farms. After about 15 years from the foundation of the nation, there were about 91 agricultural cooperatives and 10 state farms. In this same time, agriculture made up more than 60% of the national income and 90% of the workforce. 
20 years later, by 1960, it made up only 22% of income and 60% of the workforce. As time went on, the collectivization of agriculture was mostly achieved with the state holding almost 80% of farmland by 1960 and cooperatives running the rest. Cooperatives and private owners did dominate livestock ownership though, with the state holding less than 3% of livestock by 1960. By 1985, each agricultural cooperative held an average of more than 60,000 heads of livestock, almost 440,000 hectares of land, and individual members were allowed to own between 10 to 15 heads of livestock per person in a household, depending on the region. Although individual state farms had on average less than half of the land and heads of livestock, they typically had access to more machines and vehicles than the average cooperative. Large-scale mechanization of farms was achieved in the 50s through Soviet support, with the Soviet Union providing the majority of the machines. A look at the economies of most of the communist bloc would be incomplete without at least acknowledging the Comic-Con. For those who aren't familiar with the Comic-Con, it was an economic alliance between many of the nations within the communist bloc, meant to coordinate with each other and provide assistance. Mongolia's entrance into the Comic-Con was extremely helpful to its economic growth through the coordination of its five-year plans, as well as the development of programs in the area of science, energy, technology, etc. Entrance also meant loans at preferential rates, lower-priced commodities from other member nations, as well as numerous scientific and cultural facilities being built in Mongolia. So anyway, we've reached the conclusion of the video. If you'd like me to continue on other aspects of the nation, like the government, history, etc., let me know. Like, subscribe, follow on Instagram and Twitter, join the subreddit, uh, check out the community tab if you'd like to participate in voting for video topics, and I'll see y'all next time.